Today, uh, we want to talk about getting the word and, and talk about this thing. Those of you who've been here, Pastor Felix has been talking uh, about the first church, the early church. Uh, and he's been having us in the uh, book of Acts, Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. And even in our leadership meetings during the week, we land in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. And I, and I want to read that first before I do anything else. But let me read what he's been talking about when we talk about Acts chapter 2. Verse 42 through 47. And I borrowed Caleb's Bible because he didn't seem to be using it at home, so I brought his. <laughs> so he's got it on his phone. That's what he tells me, Derek. He said, I got it on my phone, Dad. Uh, so Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing, the sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miracles and signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day and met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And each day the Lord added to the fellowship those who were being saved. Amen. So that gives you a picture of what was going on in the early church. Sounds like a great church, right? Sounds like a great experience. Everybody was getting along. Everybody was in awe and wonder. They were committed to prayer. They were committed to studying the word. They were committed to fellowship. They were doing all the things that God had commanded them to do. And it was a beautiful picture. I submit to you today that the picture that we see of the church today, and by the church today, I mean the church universally, the picture that we see of the church today is very different than the picture that we read in the book of Acts. Amen? Very, very different. And you say, well, how do we get from the book of Acts to that church, to the universal church that we see today? How did we get there, right? And so I want to submit to you today this thought with, a, with, with, with my big idea today is that the church has moved from, re, from re, relationship to religion and therefore is not experiencing the manifest power of God. Let me say it again. The church has moved from relationship to religion and therefore is not experiencing the manifest power of of God. Amen. So in the first church we see a church where the relationships matter. Everybody say relationships matter. Okay, it was not just their vertical relationship with God, but it was also their horizontal relationship with their brothers and sisters in Christ. They were equally passionate about their relationship with each other as they were about their relationship with God, right? And and if you read the text, the Bible says that's how God wants it anyways, right? You can't, as as he says in the text, you can't say that you love God and hate those horizontally. He says you can't even be in alignment vertically if you have hate horizontally, amen? You you can't love God and not stand Derek. (laughs) Karen Karen said, right, right. She laughed, right? Okay, she said, Lord, forgive me. No, uh, you can't love vertically and hate horizontally. It's not possible, right? It's not possible. And so here in the early church, we see a church that was committed to relationship, both vertically and horizontally. And you say, well, how did they even get there, right? Before they even got to Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47, there were some things that created such an atmosphere, right? And I'm, and I'm going to give you this simple formula, a one-word formula that created that kind of church. And it's a word that we don't like to use, right? So when I have you say it, it may be hard coming out, but trust me, it's the best word, right? So the one word that got them to Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, is the word obedience. Everybody try it. Everybody say obedience, Yeah, yeah, we don't like that word, man. As I said in first service, some of you ladies even take it out of your marriage vows. (laughs) I got two witnesses over here, and that explains a lot right now. Amen. (laughs) Right? Uh, Obey. I ain't obeying. He ain't my master. Right? 
they've taken it out. They take it out because we don't like the word obey. We don't like the word obedience. But it was the only reason that we are able to read Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47, is because early on, the people had chosen to be obedient. Oh, wait, what did you just say, Pastor Vernon? The people had chosen to be obedient. Turn to the person next to you. Say, hey, I have to choose to be obedient. So and, and as I said the, in first service, I said, when I read Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 1, I always hear my mom's voice when I read this text, right? Because I look at the children of Israel, I, 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 and I look at the early church there, I look at the early church, and I hear my mother's voice when me and Liz would go to the rec center on Friday nights. The rec center would open at 6 o'clock, and it would stay open till midnight, right? And my mom was okay with us being there, but she always gave us this speech before we left the house. Y'all better be where you said you're going to be, doing what you're supposed to be doing with who you're supposed to be doing it with. All right, Mom, we nodded, right? Now, Liz and I were good kids. <laughs> we were always where we were supposed to be, doing what we were supposed to be doing with who we were supposed to be doing it with. No, right? We, we, we knew that. But we knew this, if I went where I wasn't supposed to be and I got into a mess, I needed to run back to where I was supposed to be. <laughs> so if mama heard anything, nah, mama, I was right where you told me to be, right? So every time I read the book of Acts, I hear my mother's voice and I hear God saying that to the church. I need you to be where you're supposed to be, with who you're supposed to be with, doing what you're supposed to be doing, so I can bless you, right? I need you to be walking in obedience so that you can experience the full manifest power of God. I knew that if I walked in obedience and I got home before curfew or at curfew, I was not going to have any problems with my mom. But if Liz and I happened to wander off and end up somewhere we weren't supposed to be, and then ended up missing curfew, I knew my five foot one mother was going to have a problem with me and Liz. I could not expect the benefit of obedience if I was walking in disobedience. See what we got? I can't be over here not where I'm supposed to be, not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, with who I'm not supposed to be with, and expect the blessings of obedience. So here, the first church, in Acts chapter 1, you see them in verse number 4. Jesus tells them in Acts 1 and 4, stay in Jerusalem. Okay? He's saying, look, some things are getting ready to go down. I'm getting ready, to have, I'm getting ready back to ascend back to the Father. And he says, I need you to stay in Jerusalem. What was the word he told him to do? Stay, right? Some of us are in trouble in our lives right now because God said stay and you keep moving. God says stay at that job until you have another one. But you so mad, big and bad, <laughs> you walk away and then you mad at God because the door ain't open. And God said, I didn't tell you to leave that door right there, but because you can't have, you walked away, okay? God said, stay at that church, right? But you big, bad, and ugly, and you think that every other church ain't got problems, and you leave the church God told you to stay at, and you go to the other church, and you find out the common denominator between that church and the new church is you, God says, stay. Stay right here because a blessing is coming. How many of you guys have ever quit something too soon? Now, I'm not talking about a bad, I'm talking about a good thing. Like you quit going to the gym before you got a little six pack. Your stomach was just starting to hurt and just starting to change. And you gave up. Went right back to the donut and pop, right? 
okay? Gave up too soon, right? But the Lord's like, look, stay, stick it out. Even though it's hard, even though it hurts, even though it's messy, stay right there because a blessing is coming. See, some of us give up. There was a song they used to sing when I was a kid. They used to say, I was right at the edge of a breakthrough and I couldn't see it. See, sometimes all the stuff you're going through, all of the mess, all of the struggle, all of that that you're going through makes you want to leave. And everything that God is saying is saying, stay. You say, God, but I don't like it. God, it hurts. God, it's this. And God says, that's got nothing to do with what's on the way. See, the adversary will have you distracted by everything that's going on and forget a promise that God made. See, Acts 1 and 4, he says, stay. And then you get to Acts 1 and 8, and he says, look, I I need you to stay there because you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He says, look, stay right here. The power is coming. Okay. We, 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 we lose our staying power because things get difficult. We lose our staying power because things are not happening fast enough. There are many in here who, just like me, who have bought gym memberships. And you've gone a couple times. This was before Jeff, right? You've gone a couple times, right? And, and, and now that, that, that membership card is somewhere deep in your wallet, you know, all crinkled up. Right? And, or you don't know where it's at. And, and, and because you didn't stay, because it got difficult, it got hard. And God says, look, I need you to push through sometimes. Let me just tell you, I got young people in here because our youth services are here combined with us. This is what young people need to understand, is that the blessing is not in the quitting. Right? I, 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 got, a, I got a young person in my life who every, every three months, every four months got a new job. I didn't like this boss, and da 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 and that just over and over again. And I said, wait, 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 wait. Let me just tell you this, what I've learned in my life. Sometimes, and not, not sometimes, but most of the time, the blessing is in the staying. See, because what God is trying to do, God is trying to, remember, again, he who promised, right? Who promised, who told them to stay in Jerusalem? Jesus, not Vernon, not Derek, not Jamie, not Annette, not Karen, Jesus, Right? Derek might tell me to stay somewhere and then forget about me. And then I text him and I say, man, where you at? He said, oh, man, I fell asleep, man. It was a long day at Kaiser, man. I'm so sorry. Right? He forget about me, right? But Jesus says stay because I've got something coming, right? Trust me, right? You and I have got to understand that the person who's asked you to stay, the person who's asked you to wait is Jesus, And since Jesus has said stay and wait, you can count on the fact that a blessing is coming because he who promised is what? Faithful. Okay? This is what was going on in the early church. This is the early church who was taking God for his word, believing that if God said to do it, they should do it. And if they did what God said that they should do, God would continue to do what he said he would do. I know this. God keeps his word, right? Turn to somebody next to you. Say, hey, God keeps his word, right? So God says stay. You get to Acts 1 and 8. He says you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Then all of a sudden Pentecost happens. The Holy Spirit falls on them. And as pastor was preaching, all of them began speaking in tongues, right, in different languages, right, for the purposes of the fact that what God had done in the room, God was doing in the room, preparing the room for the work that was outside. You hear what I just said? God was doing something in the room to prepare the room for the work that was outside. I love what Quill said about the young adults. We are, we are getting on fire for the Lord, and we're going to take the word outside of the house. Amen. You know God doesn't get us all riled up in here and get us all equipped in here just to look at each other and say, hallelujah, brother. God love you, brother. That's not why God does this. God gets us all worked up and equipped in here that we might go out there and tell a lost and dying world that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father. Father, but by him. 
So that's what was going on in the early church. The early church was sitting there in obedience. The early church was sitting there. They were doing what God said do. They were waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit. And after the Holy Spirit fell upon them, then, then, then something shifted in them, and they were able then to shift the culture. That's the early church. That's not the church today. Let me say it again. That's the early church. It's not the church today. The church that we live in today is very different. The church that we live in today has another word that, that, op, that we operate by, and that word is disobedience. Everybody say disobedience. Everybody understands what happens when you're disobedient. Everyone who has ever received a whooping, raise your hand. Amen. Praise God. Those of you who did not raise your hands, again, that explains a lot. <laughs> okay, exactly. I'm married to her. Amen. Um, okay. okay, they were living in disobedience. Now, this is what had happened to the church. Now, they were doing all these things that God wanted them to do in the early church, and then all of a sudden you get to Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, and the Holy Spirit begins to speak to the seven churches. And he says to the church at Ephesus, you are a loveless church. Okay? He says, you have left your first love. He says to the church, uh, he says to the church at Smyrna, you are a persecuted church, meaning that you took a stand for me and the culture came at you hard, right? And so because they came at you hard, you kind of, you know, back down a little bit because you're like, oh man, they're coming at us hard, right? And then he said, Pergamos, you are a compromising church. Okay? What you've done is you've taken the word of God and you've compromised it to make it comfortable for the culture that you're in. Okay? He says, then you get to Thyatira. Thyatira, you are a straight up corrupt church. You become political. What's driving you is not kingdom agenda, but it's a political agenda. It's a social agenda. It's not God's agenda. He said about Thyatira, and he says, look, not only Thyatira, but he says, and Sardis, Sardis, you just a dead church. You just dead. Ain't no shout in you. Okay, ain't no joy in you. Y'all are just, y'all just those zombies when you, y'all just a dead church. And then he gets to Philadelphia. Everybody loves Philadelphia. Philadelphia is the faithful church. Enduring all of this stuff, Philadelphia stays faithful. And then as he gets to the last church, Laodicea, he says something interesting. He says, Laodicea, you are a lukewarm church. Now, I'll give you a little geography lesson. In Laodicea, they, the geography and water lesson, the, in, 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 in Laodicea, their water came through aqueducts, a very elaborate aqueduct system where the water would come through and it would flow. And some would say that the whole process didn't have a way to cool the water, didn't have a way to heat the water. So the water came out and it was warm and it was tepid, right? So people who did not know about this would visit Laodicea and they would, you know, they'd be, they'd be hot and they'd come and they'd just guzzle the water because they were thirsty and that warm water would hit the belly and it would cause them to vomit. Sound effects, just beautiful, right? It would cause them to just vomit, right? And, and if you didn't know, again, about Laodicea and water, that's what you would do. And so some say that what the text is saying is that he's talking about these different conditions of water. That in Laodicea, the water was tepid, it was warm, it caused a lot of bacteria to grow in it. So anytime people would drink it, they would be sick. And what he was doing was comparing it to Colossae. Colossae, about six miles southeast of Laodicea, was where there were cool waters, right? There were cool waters that would quench the thirst. There were cool waters, kind of like those Coors commercials where they show our Rocky Mountain water coming down from the mountains. It looks all crystal clear and, and it's all perfect. That was the water that was in Colossae. But then there was also Heropolis, okay? Heropolis was like our Glenwood Springs or Idaho Springs. It had spring water that had a lot of minerals and that water was good to help heal the body. So it says some of the text is saying that, that it's talking about the different kind of water sources. And so, therefore, it's saying that he wishes, and we'll get to Revelation 3. If you, Revelation 3 that says, 14 says this. Let me read it. 3 and 14. 
Write the letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful, and the true witness, and the beginning of God's new creation. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let me pause really quick there. Um, I, I want you to, to get this. I, I love, look who, look who he says is talking. This is the message from the church. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation, right? So this is what I love, is the Holy Spirit just dropped this and says, look, there are some people who can speak to you with authority and tell you about yourself because of who they are, right? And so before this gets dropped on the Laodicean church, he reminds them who's talking. He says, the amen is talking, right? He says, the faithful and true witness is talking. The beginning of God's new creation is talking. So when he sets out his resume like that, you know he about to go in on you. Yeah. Let, let me just tell y'all, y'all listening to people in your life who have no credibility, no credentials, no wisdom, Right? And, 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 the, and the AM, the amen is trying to talk to you. The faithful and the true witness is trying to talk to you. The one who was from the beginning is trying to talk to you. The one with the credentials to tell you about yourself. See, because you think can't nobody tell you anything. Well, this morning, the amen wants to talk to you. This morning, the true and faithful witness wants to talk to you. This morning, the one who is, has been there from the beginning of God's new creation, he wants to speak. And look what he says to Laodicea. I know all things that you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. So in the uh, comparison to Colossae and Heropolis, if you use that as the context for explaining that text, he's saying you're not usable. See, I can do something with cold water, it'll quench my thirst. I can do something with hot water, it can help heal my body. But that lukewarm water just makes me sick. And the text is saying, look, God wants to know, are you usable? Are you hot or you cold, right? Or are you just lukewarm and you make God sick? Right? You make God want to vomit because God doesn't know where you stand. Amen. So that's one way to look at it. The second way that the theologians and, and all these great, these great pastors, when they look at the text, and I like this one, they look at it as it is when he's saying hot or cold, it's are you receptive to God, to Jesus Christ, or are you rejecting Jesus Christ, right? In our context of understanding that, that God is all about relationship, in our, in our context of understanding that God is not about religion, but God's about relationship, cold would be rejecting Jesus Christ, Hot would be receiving Jesus Christ and being on fire for Jesus Christ, and then lukewarm would be religion. Now, let me tell you something about lukewarm. Lukewarm is going to church on Sunday for the block of time that you go, and then maybe going on Wednesday and thinking you have relationship. Let me say it again. Lukewarm is you believing that going to church on Sunday and maybe on Wednesday means that you have relationship. What you have is religion, okay? If my wife and I, been married 21 years, luckiest woman on the planet, um, if she said, Karen, girl, they went out and she said, girl, Vernon only want to talk to me on Sundays. 75 minutes. No more, no less. <laughs> He just won't talk to me for 75 minutes. And every now and then, he want to cuddle on Wednesdays. Karen would say, girl, that's not a relationship. Right? She said, girl, where is he spending his other time? All the sisters, see, they got that right there. Now I'm going to be attacked after service. I'm just using this as an analogy, Right? <laughs> right? She say, girl, where is he spending his other time? Because wherever he's spending his other time is the relationship. We keep trying to tell Jesus, Lord, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today because you care for me. We telling him. 
in such a special way. That's why I praise you. I lift you up. I magnify your name. Broncos are on. Broncos are on. I got to go. Right? Sorry, Jesus. The game kicks off in 10 minutes. Got to go. Sorry, Jesus. It's a unity fest today, and I want to get my ribs. But we tell God we love him. No, no, what we are is we're like Laodicea. We're stuck in religion. And that religion is not relationship. Right? And so you go on, you go on in the text, you go on in the text, and he says, hey, hey, Laodicea, remember who's talking to you. The, the, remember, the, the faithful one. Right? Remember, the, the one who was from the beginning. Look, look, look what he says to them. He said, I wish that you were hot or cold, but neither. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will what? Spit you out of my mouth. He said, Laodicea, let me tell you something about yourself. You think, and this is me paraphrasing, not in the text. He says, you think that because you go to church, you're a Christian. He says, Laodicea, that's what you think. You think you, you go to church, you go through the religious motions, you do the shouting, you do the dancing, you, you might do the flags, whatever you do. Um, he says, you, you think that that makes you a Christian. He goes, but go stand in a garage. And tell me, when standing in that garage... Do you turn into a car? No. Coming to church does not make you a Christian. Just as standing in a garage does not make you a car. But if I stood in a garage and became a car, I'd be a nice muscle car. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't. I'd be an old truck with a big old wheel on the front. <laughs> right? Okay? He says it does not make you a Christian. And what we have done, what we have done to the younger generation, because we've been walking in disobedience, we have created a church culture that says as long as I go on Sunday, I'm all right. I can live raggedy every other day of the week. I can live raggedy every other hour of the day. But as long as I go on Sunday, me and Jesus is in relationship. The devil is a lie. Y'all need to study Romans. Romans says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Amen. Somebody has lied to you to make you think that you can keep living recklessly and call yourself in relationship. I cannot be married to my wife and have boo things on the side who I'm texting and chatting and Instagram and saying we still together. That ain't a relationship. Okay, that's emotions. We go through the motions. We get up in the morning. Hey, how you doing? We brush our teeth. Have a good day. She goes her way. I go my way. We come back home like two ships in the night. We pass. That is religion. And what we have been caught up in the church today is religion. And let me tell you what the enemy is not scared of. Religion. Okay? Y'all can shout all you want in here. You can praise God all you want in here, but until it becomes a live reality out there, Satan ain't even worried about you. Some of us are, some of y'all be rebuking the devil and da 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 da, and the devil hears that. He says, I ain't even messing with them. Why are they blaming me? That's them. They choosing religion, not relationship. Okay, look, remember what I said. The, the, the one who is faithful. So don't get mad at me. I didn't say this. Okay, he said it. I dare you to get mad at God, though. Uh, he says in verse 17 of chapter 3, you say I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need anything. Okay? He says this is the perspective of those who just go to church. Okay? We go to church and all of a sudden we get this arrogance that I'm good. Right? I'm better than Okay, but as soon as you get out of your better than, you get in your car and somebody cuts you off and you show them you're better than. Not this sign, but a different one. Amen. Okay, as soon as we, we said first service, you know, you know how it is when you we, we'll be in church and, and we'll be worshiping and all of a sudden someone is singing loud and we will praise you for the rest of our days. Yes, we will praise you for the rest of our days. Everybody's clapping their hands. Yes, Lord, for the rest of our days. Yes, Lord, for the rest of our days. Right? And then that guy, keep clapping. Then that guy who was out there. And just cussed his wife out 
before they walked into church and told her all this, he goes really loud, yes, yes. And everybody's like, yeah, he loved the Lord. He loved the Lord. And his wife said, perpetrating fraud. <laughs> right? <laughs> and he's all, yes. And she's like, oh, yes, I'm going to leave him tomorrow. <laughs> right? We deal with this false sense of identity simply because we come to church on Sunday. It doesn't mean anything. It's very important, the Bible tells us in Hebrews, don't forsake the gathering together of the saints as the manner of some is, right? It's very important that we come together. Acts, we read it in 1 and 2. It's very important that we come together. But it's not to come together to pretend like we wasn't raggedy before we got in here. Okay? I think that's why, you know, I, when, I, when Quill talks about the young adults, when I hear my kids talk about the church, when I hear these youth talk about the church on Wednesday nights, one of the biggest things that we've heard, and some of us even said it when we were younger, I can't stand those hypocrites, right? One thing here, another thing there. And, and they're not talking about we're perfect, and I think they get that. They get that we still make mistakes, but they're talking about outright I can't even tell that you love Jesus other than on Sunday. That's what they're talking about. Not that you don't sin, not that you don't make mistakes, but that I can't even tell who you are in a relationship with when you are outside of the church. And that should not be the case. Okay? There's no way that Brighton should see me anywhere and be confused about if I love Jesus. Right? There's no way that my sons should see me anywhere. They see me mess up. My family sees it. They see the flaws, but they tell you, hey, I know daddy loves Jesus. That should never be in question if we are in relationship with Jesus. What God has for us, look, 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 look again. What he says, he says, look, you got this arrogance just because you go to church. It should never be said of you by a neighbor who doesn't know Jesus. Look. The only difference between you and me is you waste your time on Sunday. Ooh. Lord, help us. That a, a, a neighbor says to you, look, the only difference is you waste your time on Sunday. At least I get to wash my car. Right? But look what he says. He says, because of your spiritual arrogance, because you think that, you know, going through the routine is, is what it is, he says, what you need to understand is this. You don't realize that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Woo. Everybody say, ouch. Right? Does this dress make me look fat? Look, everybody, everybody knows, right? Don't ask that question. Right? It's like I said about these mirrors, right? At, at the barbershop, the men, they don't give us a full figure mirror. You know what they give us? Little mirror. Right? Because they look at, we look at the little mirror, and I look like a million dollars. I can't tell that I'm out of shape when I look in the barbershop mirror. After I have my, my daughter will tell you, my, both all of my kids will tell you this, that after I get a haircut, they all get a Snapchat picture from me. Their haircut. <laughs> I think I'm the best looking thing since sliced bread, right? I send a picture to them, I'm all different angles, right? The sun's hitting great, right? My daughter's taught me about that. Your light's got to be popping or you ain't got to have a good picture, right? And so I send it to them and I say, "Woo, brother going to conquer the world today, right? Because that mirror, that little mirror, right? But then if I get in front of that big old mirror at the gym, can't stand that mirror because that mirror shows me some things about myself that I would otherwise want to deny, right? The little mirror just shows me what I want to see. Oh, man, I'm fine. Ain't nothing wrong with me. I go to church on Sunday. I shout on Wednesdays. I give my money. I, I do all of this. I volunteer in children's. I, I sit on the experience team. All of that little mirror says I'm all right. But then I walk by that big old mirror at the gym. And that big old mirror at the gym, 
Whew. It show everything, right? So when I walk by that big old mirror at the gym, this is what I do. I call it the tuck-in exercise, right? I walk by the big old mirror at the gym, and I start going like this. Yeah, how y'all doing? How y'all doing all right? Hurting myself, just trying to hold everything up. Right? That just hurt right there, right? <laughs> we don't like the full figure mirror that shows us all of us. Lord, am I just playing church? Lord, am I just going through the religious routine? Or do I have a relationship with you? God, am I dwelling with you every day of the week? God, do you have every hour? Can you interrupt any hour of my day? God, or is it just religion? Can God interrupt any hour of your life at any moment? Are you going to send him the voicemail? You're going to schedule another time. We'll do it, right? Won't we do it? He says, but if you were in relationship, anybody knows me like... My wife and my kids can disrupt anything, any moment of my life, and not just in my family, period, right? They can disrupt any moment of my life. If Jamie calls me, I don't care who you are. If she says to me, hey, I got off early, I'm about to get off early too, amen, okay? <laughs> hey, that's just what it is, right? You, look, that's, yes, that's the boo thing. If she says, I got, now she says this, I got off early, and the kids ain't home. Ah! I'm already at the house. She can interrupt my schedule. I love her like that, right? Now, wait, wait, wait. The Bible tells me that my love for God should make my love for her look like hate. So if I love Jamie like that, that at any moment she can interrupt what's going on in my day and nothing is as important as her, then what do you think God can do? God wants to say, Vernon, look, if, I, if Jamie calls you and says, hey, I'm off, and, and you say, all right, baby, I'm on my way, and then God says, wait, I need you to minister to that guy. God wants me to say, baby, hold on, I got to minister to that guy. God has to be able to interrupt any hour of my day if I'm in relationship with him. But if I am in religion with him, God can only mess with me uh, at 11 o'clock to about 1230. And after that, I'm going to start looking at my watch. Okay? Relationship versus religion. What has, demi what has been the demise of the church is we have allowed those things, like I said with the other churches, to impact us, to, in to, to corrupt us, and we have become a religious people and not a relationship people. We have forgotten about our relationship with him. We've forgotten about the power of our relationships with each other. Okay, look at this as we rush to close. He says in the text, he says, you think you're this way, but you're not. Verse 20, he says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and will share a meal with you. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone who has an ear to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. What is the Spirit saying to you today? What is he saying to me today? He is saying, stop playing religion. Stop playing church and enter into relationship. Not just relationship with God, because that's just one piece of it, but enter into relationship with God and with healthy relationship with one another. He says, if we want to change the culture, if we want to really do and see the power of God manifested in us and through us, he goes, we've got to be a relationship people, not a religion people. Pastor Kay said something a few weeks ago. I don't know if anybody caught it when she was up here doing the offering. And she, she made a statement and said, you know what? Uh, most of us, we come here and we don't see each other until the next Sunday. Right? How can we be in relationship and the only time we see each other is the time we're here together? That's not the model that we see in the early church. The early church says they did life together because they were in relationship.
They prayed daily together. They broke bread with gladness daily together because they were in relationship. See, it ought to matter to you what goes on in Derek's life on Monday. It ought to matter to you. It ought to matter to you if Bernard is struggling on Wednesday, right? It ought to matter to you if Lynn is having a rough Thursday. It ought to matter to you how Patrick is feeling on Thursday after his Wednesday, right? It ought to matter to you. It ought to matter to you how Pastor Kay's feeling. It ought to matter to you how's Pastor Felix doing. It should matter to you how the people sitting next to you are living from day to day. If we are going to experience the power of God, we've got to get back to relationship, and we've got to stop playing religion. Look at the person next to you. So we've got to get back to relationship. And stop playing church. Yeah. God is calling us this day to be men and women of God who say that it's about relationship. How many today want it to be about relationship? How many today want it really to be about, God, I love you with all of my heart, with all of my mind, with all of my soul. How many today really want it to be about, God, not only do I love you, but I love Topaz. I love Annette. I love Elder Brenda with all of my heart, with all of my mind. I love them as I love myself. How many folks are committed to relationship today? If you're committed to relationship, I want you to respond to the word of God today. This is, what, this is the great thing that we do with God, that when he speaks, we respect him and we respond to his word. So if you're committed to relationship today, I just want you to move towards the altar today. I want you to come up, recommit yourself to relationship today, not to playing church, not to, not, to, not to just come here on Sunday, but I want you to move today, move forward. Say, God, today I'm committed to relationship. Today, God, I, I'm committed to loving you. Today, God, I'm committed to loving these people that I get to share the journey of life with. I'm committed today, God, to being concerned about how are they doing on a Monday? How are they doing on a Tuesday? How are they doing when they go back to college? How are they doing on that new job? How are they doing with that new baby? I'm committed to these things. And today, this is what God is calling us to. He's calling us to relationship. He says, men and women of God who stand before me today, I need you to let go of religion because religion cannot save you. But on a hill far away, on a hill far away, relationship saved you. On a hill far away, Jesus Christ gave his life that you and I might have a right to the tree of life. And he did not do it for us to play church. He did it for us to be in relationship. Right relationship with God and right relationship with each other. And today, we choose to walk in that. So lift your hands today and say, God, look. God, look, we're, we're lifting our hands, God, and we are surrendered to you today. We are responding to your word today, God. We hear you speaking to us, God. And we say, forgive us for playing church. Forgive us for being fooled by religion. Forgive us, God, for thinking that religious routine made us better. That coming here on Sunday made us better. God, that's not what makes us better. God, what makes us who we are is our relationship with you and our relationship with these other men and women who love you. And so today, God, we reject the bondage of religion. We reject the strongholds of religion, God, and we accept the freedom that you give to us in relationship, God. We embrace the freedom and the power that you give to us in relationship, God. Thank you for restored relationship, God. Thank you for seeing us broken by sin, and you loved us enough, God, to restore relationship, God. Thank you for seeing us at our worst, God, and you restored relationship, God. Thank you for seeing us messed up, God, and you lifted us up, God. Thank you, God. Thank you for being the repairer of the breach, God. Thank you, God, for bringing brothers back together. Thank you for bringing marriages back together. Thank you for bringing families back together, God. Thank you, God. You are the restorer, God. You are the restorer, God. In the name of Jesus, God. Restore, God. Every hurt, heal it right now, God. Every wedge, remove it right now, God. 
every bit of malice this God erase it right now God every all the spirit of selfishness God remove it now in the name of Jesus God the enemy does not want us together God the enemy does not want us operating vertically aligned and horizontally aligned but God today we declare healthy relationship God today we declare God renewed relationship God heal hearts right now God God right now move someone to say I forgive even though nobody's asked you for it give it right now in the name right now give it in the name of Jesus God set yourself free set yourself free right now say I forgive I forgive and allow this great God who has restored our relationship to move us forward in relationship every heart every mind right now God move us forward in relationship that we might be the light of the world that we might be a city on a hill that we might be the salt of the earth that the world might know that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man cometh unto the Father but by you. Let them know that we are Christians by our love. Let them know that we are Christians by our love, not because we came to church, but because we live love every day. Let them know that we are Christians by our love every day. Oh God, we don't want to be lukewarm. We want to be on fire for you, God. We want to be used by you, God. We want this world transformed, men and women saved, because you saved us. You did not save us to be silent, but you saved us, God, to reach out to others. So right now, God, we choose relationship over religion. We choose relationship over religion. We choose relationship over religion. We love you, God. We pray for that soul right now who has made a decision to love you, who's made a decision to give their life to you. And God, we want them to know they found a place where they can grow in healthy relationship, a place where they can become all that you want them to be. Save, save, save. In Jesus' name. Now take the time to hug somebody and tell them I'm grateful for our relationship.